Okay. How many are you expecting? Are you expecting? Um, well, it's not a RSVP situation, but it will be posted. Mm -hmm. So I just hit live and Facebook is like a couple seconds behind. So, um, yeah, but we'll get comments that pop up and we can answer questions. So, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone. It is Wednesday. It, I've been thinking all week that it's the end of the week on a Friday, but it's Wednesday here in November. And we are talking today with Cami Nihapali from Mixed Plate Press. Cami, welcome. And thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry my dogs are barking. And so I was muting myself. So. <laughs> That's okay. If they keep barking, you might have to come and introduce them. <laughs> <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> so we have told our authors that you work in, on the editing process. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and Mixed Play Press? Sure. Yes, I am. Um, I've been, I probably should go back a little bit to understand the editing part. I was a high school English teacher for 20 some odd years and spent a lot of time teaching writing and reading and writing, cr reading critically and writing and writing critically. So I spent a lot of time through going through that idea of developing voice with students and developing writing technique and tools. When I left the classroom and went into writing full time, I put on an editor hat um, as well because I have a lot of skill in that area in terms of just trying to help people with with their writing. Hi, Lauren. And so that's where when I went to writing full time, I developed I opened Mixed Plate Press, and which is really my own independent author imprint, but it is also my business. And that's where the editing comes in. Okay, great. Did I answer that question enough? Sorry, I was distracted by my stinking dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. So I'm fascinated to learn more about the editing process. But before we get there, I wanted to know some more about what your writing process looks like. Oh, my writing process is um, well on a day to day. Uh, day, um, day. Let's say you plan one day to be this is a writing day. What does that look like? Well, really, what I do is I split my day in half. So half of my day is really spent on the business side of Mixed Plate Press. This is if I have other projects, other clients that need work. So I spend all, my eight usually, well, actually, I'm up around five in the morning. So I do some writing in the morning and then between seven or whatever time I need to be up because Hawaii is always behind everyone in time. That time, that morning is spent working. So editing projects, emails, my own newsletters, whatever needs to get done and happen for that business side of things for Mixed Plate Press. That's what I'm doing then. Then in the afternoon and evening is usually spent on my own creative projects. And as my process goes, I've got that drafting. I set it aside. And while that project is sitting, I'm usually working on another project. So I kind of do this spiral scaffold uh, okay. between projects. And that's how I'm able to work on multiple projects at the same time. So while one's sitting, I'm working on the next phase of whatever that is, if it's revision or editing and then so on and so forth. Okay. And that's your, that's how you're able to tackle multiple projects in a yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So what sort of services does Mixed Plate offer? Um, we do story consulting and then we do editing. Uh, pretty much that's it. Like right now I'm working with a couple of friends who really want to work on putting together a, a memoir for younger, a younger female audience, um, young adult, I would say, and just trying to help them through the process. So from just getting them motivated to get started <laughs> and helping them with just thinking about story and how to approach it. And so I think one of my strengths as a human being is understanding story. So my strengths are probably in developmental and line editing versus the refined copy proofread. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can do both, all of it, but I think my goal or my strengths are in that story narrative part right. of writing. And so that's really all we do. We just do the, the 
I'm sorry, we do the story consulting and then we do the editing, developmental line, copy and proofing. Okay, and um, to back up into the writing process, Lauren was asking, how do you get your own book ideas? Oh, my own book ideas. I, they often come to me in little snippets of a, like a vision. Uh, for example, in the story starts tell, I had this image of a high school senior standing in her locker. And when I think of senior, I think 17 or 18, she's in her locker and she looks down the hall at this boy she's had a crush on forever. This young man, she's had a crush on him forever and she wouldn't go talk to him. And my writer brain was, why is that happening? And so I just started playing with that idea in my head. I wrote the scene and I realized, ooh, I wanna know more about these characters. Um, on the, the next book, In the Echo of This Ghost Town, it really came from a question from a reader who, there was this moment in the story starts to tell when the main hero, Tanner, looks at his best friends and they're in the process of their relationship being ripped apart because they're both growing in different directions. And his friend, who is a real jerk, his name is Griffin, says something and there's a moment, just a snippet of vulnerability that you see in him. And a reader asked me, I really wanna know more about that moment. And so it, oh. I, I, my writer brain went, oh, I need to explore this a little bit. And when I did, I realized there was a story there for him. And that's where In the Echo of This Ghost Town came from. What a compliment that a reader picked up on that. Yes, it was very much a compliment for sure. So would you say that you start more with a plot idea when it's like a vision like that? Or do you start with say character development and work and work from their problems and their vulnerabilities? I definitely start with character, character, character motivation, character needs versus wants. And then it kind of unfolds. The plotting comes in later after I really have an understanding of the character. Okay. Great question, Lauren. Yes, I think great we could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> we probably could. Yeah. Okay. So Mixed Point Press does um, offers. You mentioned the different types of editing: um, developmental, line, copy, and proof. Can you tell us the difference between each one? Uh, a lot of our authors in this group are first-time authors working on their first manuscript. So some of this they may not have heard of before. Sure. Uh, developmental editing is like the first step of editing. It's when you've hopefully written that first draft, you have a really pretty strong sense of what the story is. Developmental editor will come in and look and see what you have and find where they're looking at that big picture. So the big picture narrative, where are the characters? What are their motives? They're looking at settings, so all those elements of literature, setting, conflict. Is there a theme or threads to a theme that are starting to emerge? So they're looking at that big picture story. Developmental editing is takes the most time. It is also the most expensive of the editing. And it's just because of that issue that you're really trying to fill in the gaps, all those puzzle pieces, so that when you take those puzzle pieces and put them back together, you have an actual complete story. Then and you have line. Be, excuse me, Go that ahead. could be for fiction or nonfiction. Yeah, right? it can be for either, yeah, it, okay. it, for anything. And then okay. you have line editing, which instead of looking at the big picture story, you're now looking at the function of, I would say form, form is probably a better way to describe it, the form of language. So how is the author using language to convey that story? You're really looking at passive versus active voice. You're looking at word choice. You're looking at motif. You're looking at symbolism. You're looking at how these words are strung together in terms of um, syntax to convey that specific author's voice and capture how they're portraying the story in the best way possible with the words and the, the conventions that you're they're using. Okay. And then you go on to copy editing, which is really looking at the function of language are the commas in the right place? Are you using the correct homonym? Uh, is the sentence, is the punctuation you have run-ons? How are you breaking conventions for, or not, is it working? So you're really looking at, uh, at the grammar side of English or the, the rules, the rules and how that all comes together to, to put the best foot forward of your work. 
And then proofreading, which is looking at the very last. This is the last to go over. We need to make sure that the font looks correct. The, the quotation marks are all there. It's the really nitty gritty detailed stuff that is really looking for that, that final pass that not everybody can catch. Okay. So would an author need to go through all, is it necessary to hire an editor for all four types of editing? I've really? heard the strong advice on it's worth it and it's well worth your money to have someone else edit your book. Um, yes. Are all I hire an editor. Is necessary? <laughs> yes, I hire an editor, but I don't necessarily think that it's necessary to hire all stages of the editor. I think it really comes down to what your strengths and weaknesses are as a writer. And for some people, they have like, I have this great idea and this awesome story idea and I can plot it out and I can put in that rough A, B, C, D, E, F, G all the way through, but I, can't, I don't know if it's coming across. Like, I don't know if I'm hitting all of the, the pieces of this narrative puzzle. So I need a developmental editor to help me make sure I have all of those pieces in place. I always hire a copy editor because I feel like my strengths are in that narrative. My strengths are in the line. I can do put things together with language, but I don't always catch the big, the errors. I don't always mm -hmm. catch when I've used a uh, peak P E E K versus P E A K. So some of those, um, those little nitty gritty things, I know I won't always catch because I'll read it incorrectly. So I always mm -hmm. hire a copy editor. Uh, so I don't know that necessarily you have to hire all of them, but really kind of understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are. And I know for me personally, I need the copy editor. So I, I hire that out. Okay. And we have um, Jennifer Hobbs is one of our authors. Can you explain one more time Copy yes, editing. sure. Copy editing is the person who's looking at your, this is like you've gotten to the point of finished draft. You're almost to the end. So you've probably gone through three, four, five revisions at this point, maybe even worked with a developmental or a line editor and you've reached the point where it's, it's pretty much done and it probably might even be in its format. It's going to get sent to a copy editor who's going to look at the rules and the conventions of writing as they exist within your manuscript. So are your commas in the right place? Are you using them correctly when it's two complex sentences put together? Are you using semicolons properly? Are things capitalized? You got the punctuation in the right place. Are you using passive or active um, voice? So those are the kind of things that a copy editor is looking at, really just focusing on the rules and the conventions of writing. Okay. Um, so if we could talk more about developmental editing, is it different from a book coach? Hmm, I think that's a great question. I think a developmental editor, I haven't done um, book coaching. So please keep that in mind as I answer this question. And maybe someone who's in there who has done book coaching could, could add to it. As a developmental editor, you're not looking at really the book so much in the finished product as you're looking at story. A really good developmental editor is gonna understand the marketability of your story and how to help you tease out that story to make it as marketable as possible. I don't think that they're looking, they're really focused on story. What is in between the pages of the, that book cover? And they're wanting to help you hone in and really hammer home the themes, the conflict, the character, and how the character takes us through that narrative. Whereas I, I think a book coach is really trying to help you take your idea and get it to into a book form, get it on, on the bookshelf. And that's how I would categorize the differences. And I'm not sure if that's completely accurate. I would agree with that <laughs> definition. Um, I think... I definitely think that some people could use either term interchangeably. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I think that book coaching looks at the whole, the story and the book from a big picture viewpoint mm -hmm. and the developmental editor looks at the story. Okay. So I, I would definitely agree with that. Lauren, if you're still listening, if you want to pipe in, <laughs> you yes. have a differing opinion, let us know. 
<laughs> um, so how, what's it like working with an author? How involved is, oh, she says, unless your book coach is Lauren Eckhart. <laughs> <laughs> See? See, it depends. <laughs> Uh, she says, LOL, I think overall that's right, but I always blend them. Yeah. Agree. It's yeah. a gray line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So how involved is an author when you work with them? Oh, um, I have had, I've had experience in kind of two different ways. I've had the very involved sending over pages and here's kind of where we're at in this section of the book and we're we're talking about it and conferencing and then i've also had it where Harding soul press has sent me a manuscript and said would you edit this for me and it's very removed from the author i think when it comes to developmental editing it's probably a very good idea to have an editor that fits the needs of the author i think because there is such an important um relationship that has to be built between the author who's offering this vulnerability of their work and an editor who is a critique person. They're the person who's going to say, this is not working. There needs to be a level of trust, I think, between that author and the editor and their approach needs to mesh to some extent. Like that author has to be willing to look, listen to that editor and say, I trust you enough to really think about what you're asking me to do and ask me to change. Cause that's not easy. Right. And an editor has to be willing to tell them the tough stuff because that's not easy either to, to offer someone who's given you their work and say, this really isn't working yet. And here's some right. ideas. Right. So um, I think there has to be like when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with an author, I think there has to, I really hope there's a level of trust that's occurring between the two of us for me to be able to be honest and frank about what's going on in their story. Because ultimately it's about helping, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's about helping the author create the best version of their story. And it's not about what is about me and what I think about story. It's about how do we make this story the best, but that doesn't always happen for each personality. Like I think that there is a level of getting to know one another to make sure that that relationship is the right fit. Right. Um, so that's, that's really kind of in the one-on-one, -on -one. but then I've also had, as I mentioned, the removed, just would you edit this and then send it, send it back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And so those like, for example, and say you're working with someone doing a developmental edit, would those be like Zoom meetings that you have with yes. them? Yes. Yeah. Have so, like a conversation around for sure. The story? Okay. Right. You're talking about goals. What are your goals with the story? What are your thoughts? Because I think for my goal as an editor is never to insert myself in a story. It's not my story, it's the author's story. My job as a developmental editor. Or in, in, as an editor in general, is to help them figure out what is this, how is this going to make your voice shine, and how can I help you to make your voice shine? So yeah, I think there has to definitely be that interplay between meeting on Zoom, talking on the phone. A, a writer calls and says, "Help! I'm stuck in this. I don't know what to do. What do you think?" Yeah, there's definitely that give and give and take. This is Marsha. I'm Hi, so Marcia. excited to see who Cami is. She was a phenomenal yes. editor for my book, Lighting the Path. I enjoyed reading that. That was just so heartfelt and so heartwarming. I absolutely loved reading it. Hi, Marsha. Thanks for tuning in. So um, let's see. I think that's about all the questions that we had. If anybody else is out listening and wants to chime in with any of their questions, please let us know. Um, let's see, we got a comment here from Lauren. An editor who does Zoom calls versus just recordings or emails is something else to look for. That personal interaction is key to get the feedback needed. I so agree. I think that personal connection is it's critical, I think, especially when we're, you're doing that coaching like Lauren does and then the developmental editing. I think that's so important. And then do you have any self-editing tips? Mm, self-editing tips. I know for myself, distance, time and distance from a manuscript is really critical for me. So when I'm done with a draft, putting it away for a given set of time, I, my minimum is four weeks. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I really strive to go six to eight weeks between. And the reason for that is because when I, if I write something and then as soon as I'm finished, I reread it and start tinkering again. I don't have the distance to be able to look at it critically. So when I take that time away and then I go through and reread it, it's almost like rereading a fresh story. Like I remember what the story is, but when I read it, I finally can see where the gaps are. And that's when I can start making notes. My other thing that I do in my own process is I never, when I reread the first time, I do not mark it up. I just read it. I read it as a reader would read it because um, if I start marking all the little details, I get caught up again in the detailed editing pieces instead of really keeping track of the story. So my, my process is to read it straight through. And then after I take notes, what did I notice? And it's like a kind of a stream of consciousness, this, 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 this. And then I take it chapter by chapter, page by page. Okay. So I was actually just going to ask that. What is the first thing that you do once you return to your manuscript? So are you reading it printed out on paper? Or yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. I know I read it on paper um, the first probably two or three revisions just because I need that. I need that tactile um, touch thing that happens on the page. And I'm using a pencil and I'm jotting and writing and then I'm taking and then using my computer or my laptop to make any changes. Usually I have a couple files. I have my rough draft file and then I start a brand new file that is a uh, second draft. And so that way I'm not ruining anything from the first mm -hmm. draft. Those kind of things stay there and I'm starting from scratch, copying, pasting, filling in, uh, fixing it, hopefully fixing it. Yeah. And um, did that answer the question? I was, I felt like I was on yeah, my way yeah. somewhere and then. <laughs> I'm, I'm in awe that the first pass you, the first read through, you have the discipline not to have a pen or a pencil in hand and make any notes. You're simply reading. I do reading. have a pencil in hand. If I note like a comma, I might circle it, but I keep moving. It's just okay. really the hard part is, I think the hardest part for a writer and you can do this even when you pick up a book from someone you love and you read it. You never read as a reader anymore. You read as a writer. Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading my own work, it's I have to distance myself from that whole editing revision. Because even now in the works that I've published, I could still edit it. And yeah, it's just something, it's part of our psyche now, I think, once you become a writer, that that's how you read. So I have to, I know that what, my work isn't for me, my work is for a reader. So I need to kind of try to put my reader hat on just to kind of see what makes this a good story. What is, what's shining through, what's not shining through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and what's working and what's not working. <laughs> There's always right. stuff that's not working in, a, in those early drafts. Right, do you try to read through it like as fast as possible? not like a speed read, but to be able to digest the work as one piece. Yes. So I just I spend, I think for like in the echo of this ghost town, when I printed out that first draft, I just read straight through it. I think it maybe took me a day and a half to just read straight through and then mark my notes after. And it's really just trying to do that through the lens of a reader rather than a writer. I mean, you can't separate the two. So please note that I know that as I'm reading my work, I'm reading it as a writer, but I'm trying to, ex I'm trying to examine how do I feel as I read this? Cause I, one of the things I note for myself is when I'm writing and I feel bored, a reader's going to feel bored. <laughs> They're not mm -hmm. going to like it. So I have to like really pay attention to my own feelings as I read through something. And, um, so that's really what I'm trying to do. Is that's such connect. a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question here from Lauren. What are the most important things an author can have completed or ready to go before they give their manuscript to an editor to help make that interaction and relationship the most successful? And I'm going to add on at what point is a manuscript ready for editing? 
I think that's so, both of those questions are really good. Um, I think, I think first of all, a writer needs to know what they need because I think if a writer just comes up to somebody and says, I, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about this story. I don't know anything. I don't know what I need. It's really hard to, then you're going to have to tease that out. What are you looking for? What do you, what is your goals? So I think an, a writer, and Lauren can probably comment this on a, in book coaching and story coaching, you might not have a completed draft. You might have an idea and you just don't know how to get started. That's different than say someone who has a completed first draft and they have no idea what to do next. So that, that next step is if you have a completed draft, a developmental editor has something to work with and you have something to work with and you have some goals now that you can articulate and an editor can listen to those goals and begin to help you hone in on uh, narrowing your focus, kind of that funnel, right? To try to get you to the next step, which will then be the revision. Um, I just think understanding what kind of editing you need is going to be important. Um, there was more to that question. I feel like I missed some of those um, pieces. Let me go back was... to, let's see. What are the most important things in audio completed? Yeah, I think for the developmental edit, having a draft is a really good idea, even if it's a rough draft uh, with some ideas about where you think you want to go. But that can also be teased out in the developmental edit. But a draft is very helpful for line editing, probably a revision should be done. So you should probably be in that revision process. You have a story pretty much set. Now you're really focused on how to make, how to tease that out in the language. Copy edit is pretty close to done. So you've probably revised it a few times. You may have even gone through beta readers at that point and the copy is now like, I wanna fine tune this. And then mm -hmm. proof is before it goes to publication. Right. Or maybe you're, you've already got your proof and you want it looked at one more time. Okay, and then we have one more. I'm. It just says Facebook user because it, it's not connected to StreamYard, but what advice do you have for the person who has a story in their heart but says, I don't have the ability to write? Mm. Okay, so maybe this is, I'm just going to say I don't believe no one has the ability to write. I think we all have the ability to write. We just all have different strengths and weaknesses in our writing and we also might not have practice so we might be more at a be as a beginning writer versus someone who's been experienced and i think having someone help you through that process is the perfect you know a book coach like lauren or you know something like that to help you tease that out maybe an editor to help you with the language parts or things like that but for sure yeah. <laughs> yes. See, if you can communicate, you can write. <laughs> yeah. We can all write. It's just a matter of having building the confidence. And I know writing as a teacher in high school, a lot of kids, oh, I hate writing. I'm terrible at it. Well, the, the, the key is, and I've always said this to anyone, is it's not about whether you can just sit down and write. Nobody can do that. It's about building your toolkit. And that's kind of what an editor, the story coach will help you do is build your toolkit. Well, as a one last question, and because you were a English teacher, what was your favorite <laughs> book to teach? Oh, my favorite book to teach? Oh, that's, that's like a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pick um, a favorite child. <laughs> probably To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, just is just so layered and nuanced, but I also love teaching Macbeth by Shakespeare and I'm not a big Shakespeare fan, but Macbeth just like, oh, it's so great. Um, and I enjoy pairing like some of those older white people works with um, people of color and kind of like juxtaposing that. So a lot of critical analysis and in perspective. So I never ever taught things in isolation. It was always built out, flushed out. Oh, mm -hmm. Animal Farm is great. Love that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, Cami, thank you so much for coming on. Um, today is also Cami's birthday. So Yay. wishing you a happy birthday. Thank you thank for you so spending much. part of your birthday on here with us. Yes, um, it was a pleasure. Where can we find you online? Yes, I have um, 
Mixed Plate Press website. So that's just www.mixedplatepress.com. I also have my author website, clwalters.net. And then I'm on Instagram uh, at Mixed Plate Press and then at cl.walters. So you can find me in both of those places. You can DM me and, or email me or whatever, and I'm happy to get back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again thank for you. joining us. We've got comments coming through wishing you happy birthday. And thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. So this was a pleasure. I hope this is not the last time we talk to each yeah, other. I hope so too, Claire. It's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.